Thank you, Chairman Peters and uh, Ranking Member Portman uh, for holding this, uh, this important hearing, of course, and so many others. As co-chair of the Senate Bipartisan Task Force for Combating Anti-Semitism, uh, I really want to welcome my friend Jonathan Greenblatt uh, from ADL, and of course, all the witnesses here today, Maya Berry, Elizabeth Newman, and Brian Levin, and thank you for being here today, for the work that you do, and for the thoughtful testimony that you have uh, given so far. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd also like to ask for unanimous consent that, radi that uh, radicalization exodus, this is a recently published um, report on white supremacist use of Holocaust denial and how they do that. It's authored by the American Jewish Congress. I'd like to have that entered uh, into the record if I may. Without objection. And um, I also like to thank uh, Senators Hassan and Portman for the Pray Safe Act. I'm proud to be a co-sponsor and uh, we need to do that. We need to bolster up our uh, nonprofit Homeland Security grants, all of that. And um, as I mentioned, I am co-chair of the Senate Bipartisan Task Force for Combating Anti-Semitism, which my HISGAC colleague, Senator Langford, and I co-founded in 2019. And um, I don't have to tell anyone here how alarmed I am, and I know we all are, at statistics that show that anti-Semitic hate crimes in the United States are at the highest level in recorded history. In May 2021 alone, ADL recorded 251 anti-Semitic incidents. That's a 115% jump. And might I say that's only the ones that were reported. We're sure there, I'm sure there are many that weren't reported. It's nothing new, anti-Semitism, nothing new. It's the canary in the coal mine of hatred for thousands of years. It doesn't only affect Jews and it doesn't, um, it, it just affects everybody, all Americans, particularly underrepresented minorities. And history teaches us that when the flames of anti Semitism spread, democracy itself is set ablaze. So, Mr. Greenblatt, um, could you explain why anti Semitism, it just doesn't pose a danger uh, to Jews, but to all Americans? Uh, well, thank you very much, Madam Senator, for the question, and I would really salute you for your leadership on the caucus and the task force on anti-Semitism. Um, look, I think anti-Semitism is a bit of a barometric reading on society. It's often described, as you said, as the canary in the coal mine. Sometimes it's called the oldest hatred. But as uh, Emory Professor Deborah Lipstadt has written, and I'll note that she's recently been nominated by the White House uh, to be the next special envoy for global anti-Semitism State Department. Anti-Semitism starts with the Jews, but it never ends with the Jews. It may be the conspiracy that is, a, that is at the beating heart of white supremacy, but from that springs forth a series of other forms of intolerance, right? The, we mentioned earlier the massacre at the Tree of Life Synagogue. While that was perpetrated against that shul, the reality was it was an attack really motivated by a hatred of immigrants because this individual, the shooter, whose name I won't dignify by mentioning, believed that a cabal of Jews was plotting to overrun the United States with people, with Muslims and immigrants from other countries. So from anti-immigrant hatred to anti-Muslim bias to anti-Black racism, literally all of it can be often connected to anti-Jewish hate. And appreciating the intersectional nature of all these forms of oppression means we should be committed to fighting all of them with intensity and vigor. We do that work at ADL. I know a number of my colleagues do that work as well, and I think it's just incredibly important. Well, uh, thank you for that. I'm, I'm I'm glad to have founded with the senators Tim Scott and Cory Booker the new task force on Black Jewish relations. Of Probably. course, we signed the uh, anti Asian hate crimes bill in, and you're right. We have to be met. Um, working on this on all fronts. And, and I'd like to build on what some of my colleagues have talked about in online uh, radicalization. Uh, you know, those these tools of extremism, the theories, the disinformation, we know that they're beginning and spreading quickly uh, online. They just can can morph, morph, excuse me, morph overnight, right? And so I'm relieved to see, like we spoke, companies like Facebook and Twitter taking some long overdue steps to curb the rise of hate like prohibiting Holocaust denial content. However, we're seeing extremism resurface on alternative social media platforms like Gab, which we know is a recruitment tool for neo-Nazis and was the website where we mentioned the Tree of Life Synagogue shooter posted right before that massacre. So Mr. Greenblatt, again, all too often, what enables extremist groups and individuals is the hate messaging 
to the American public and the algorithms, like you said, that are in social media. So what specific steps do you think platforms should take to ensure that the hateful content does not escalate to violence? And what checks should we put in place to ensure that uh, this violence isn't celebrated and amplified on these platforms? Well, first and foremost, I thank you very much for the question. I mentioned Section 230 reform. It's really critical. We need to do it in such a way that protects the targets of harassment and has transparency, push the companies for independent audits. And we really need to deal with the overall problematic business model, Senator, and the anti-competitive marketplace that we have. So you mentioned alternative platforms. There's Gab and there's Discord and there's Getter and Parler is trying to reemerge, et cetera. But let's be clear. Facebook is literally a trillion dollar corporation that earned $80 billion in revenue last year, $24 billion in profit. They have more users than any country on the planet has citizens. This is one of the most innovative businesses in the history of capitalism. They, if they chose to, could apply their resources to solve this problem tomorrow. It simply requires them enforcing their own terms of service. But the reason why ADL along with the NAACP Color of Change, LULAC, Common Sense Media, and others launched the Stop Hate for Profit campaign last year was the company's failure to deal with uh, anti-Black racism, anti-Semitism, other forms of hate on the platform. It was only when they came under severe reputational pressure that the company finally made a series of concessions. So I can't understate enough the power that you have because while they may be immune from revenue pressure because of their size and fiduciary pressure because of their governance, these companies are not immune to reputational pressure and regulatory pressure. So it is Facebook that is first and foremost, and our own studies show us that three times the number of people who are literally targeted and harassed online, it happens on Facebook more than anywhere else. But again, TikTok and Twitter, Clubhouse and, and Google and so many of these other companies, they all have challenges and they all merit our attention. Well, thank you. I, like I said, I appreciate the work that ADL does, that everyone here on the panel, the panels that we've had in the past, everything you all are doing to make sure that we have all the information that we need here in Washington to partner um, with, with our communities all across this country and across the globe to do the right thing to stop hate. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I see my time is up. Thank you, uh, Senator uh, Hassan. Ms. Newman, uh, uh, you said um, uh, here today that, that you've, you're seeing uh, threads of 